So hi everyone, uh, Jacob here uh, from Do Us Within Us podcast. Um, so on this podcast, as you guys know, uh, we share stories of diverse founders and investors building businesses in underserved markets or serving uh, underserved communities. And the goal is for them is to create local uh, or global impact or social impact specifically. And um, if you go back to some of our episodes, you know, we have talked to just some amazing entrepreneurs, uh, not just in the United States, but in Africa, Asia as well, um, and South America. So um, today we are, uh, I'm humbled to have with me Amanda Wang, and she is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Potencia. Uh, Potencia is, um, and she's going to elaborate on this and probably have a conversation about it. The, I think what is very interesting about them is to provide accessible, affordable, and effective English classes for adult immigrants in the United States. Um, I'm sure they have, you know, uh, I'll be excited to learn more about just in depth of what they're doing in the community here in uh, Massachusetts. But, you know, they have uh, um, just some inspiring work that they do. Uh, I mean, just beyond English teaching, you know, the empower adult learners, inspiring future leaders as well. Um, so Amanda, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I think uh, I've not done a great service to elaborate on what, what you guys do, uh, because I think there's more to it than just what I said. <laughs> I'll, I'll love to hear. I, just just give a preface. So, you know, and they, they help train the next generation of leaders, college students, high school students young professionals. And uh, so that includes, that's more than adult immigrants, actually. And they do one-on-one -on -one or small group classes virtually and in community spaces. Um, so um, there's a problem statement. I think only 5% of adult English language learners need nationwide, needs nationwide are being met. So that's a market that they're serving. So Amanda, uh, thanks for being here. Um, Thank you for the work you do beforehand. I think people don't understand how difficult it is to build uh, um, a platform like this. So um, we appreciate your work uh, with your co-founder and just the team that you built. Um, so uh, before we start, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, who is Amanda? And we can go from there. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob, for having me on your podcast. Um, let me start with, you know, who is Amanda and we can go um, from my story to my or organization story. Sure. Um, so I grew up in a very small rural town um, in China where not even many Chinese people would recognize the name of my hometown. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, in the middle of a brow, like very, so my hometown is on the grassland. <laughs> <laughs> I, I live in the city, but if you go outside of the city right away, it's visitor's destination. It's grassland with, you know, sheep, cows, horses, and those Mongolian uh, tent on top of the gra grassland. So it's quite a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, only one problem with my hometown is we have really limited education resources. Because um, even in China, you know, like when you are from like a super small town, you don't have access to all the great education. Um, that people might have in bigger cities like Beijing or Shanghai. Um, so basically, I grew up there and I got interested in uh, Western culture because, you know, you want to listen to pop music, you want to read the novels that uh, turn into dramas and movies. So I just got naturally interested in such culture, but I didn't have the real resources, good resources to learn English. Um, so basically, I taught myself English. Um, mm -hmm. definitely with the help of school teacher, but what we learn in school is more uh, exam-based English. So we would learn grammars uh, and reading comprehension, but there's no real practice in yeah. oral English and listening. <laughs> so I'm pretty uh, like deaf and uh, I cannot speak, I could not speak in English as well, although I understand certain words. Yeah. Um, so I taught myself English through <laughs> a lot of uh, American, British TV shows, mm -hmm. movies, uh, fictions, non-fictions, and especially Taylor Swift music. <laughs> um, so I, I think I build my initial, um, you know, skills, English skills through those uh, self-education. And luckily my family 
it's also very open-minded family. So they always wanted to push me to go outside and see the bigger world instead of being, uh, you know, just a small town girl and satisfied with what you uh, are surrounded with. Um, so they tried it to create a lot of opportunities for me to travel around the country. When I was young, they brought me to multiple places. Uh, and I, when I grew older, become a teenager, they start to uh, explore the idea of doing college maybe somewhere outside of mainland China uh, to have a very different perspective compared to what I've been you know, growing up with, like all the education and um, the values I, I was taught by the mainland curriculum. Um, so we definitely talk about different places. There was uh, candidates were like Canada, uh, definitely the US, not sure how to get there back then. Uh, Hong Kong was very attractive to um, high school students in mainland China back then because it's part of our culture. So you won't feel too isolated being the Chinese person in Hong Kong. Um, but at the same time, they are so open and connected with the outside world. So they basically run uh, I would say in the more under the more Western nice the value and uh, system. So it's definitely like, like a good place, attractive place for high school students to apply to. Um, and I, I I went through the college entrance exam in mainland China. I got accepted into the University of Hong Kong through that exam. Um, so I made it outside of my hometown. I, I went to Hong Kong and I did my undergrad in economics and finance. Um, at the University of Hong Kong before I decided to pursue a master's degree in the United States. Um, so I came to the States in 2018 uh, trying to study this master's in innovation and management at Tufts University. Um, yeah, and through that um, master's program, we created this project called Potencia and I was able to work on it full-time after graduation. Um, yeah, so that's my story. That's that's incredible, and thanks thanks for sharing. And I know there's a lot to unpack from that because um, you're literally squeezed in like two decades in in three minutes or four. So um, I, I imagine that um, um, there was a lot of uh, you know just life lessons. Um, looking in hindsight, you know, kind of shaped your mindset and uh, had such an impact for you to go full circle, right? You kind of, you know, as a child, you'd learn English by yourself. I think you saw the challenges, kind of the limitations that, that exist. And there's some reflection into how Potentia became uh, a platform that you, you're passionate about building. Um, just, just to go back a little bit to kind of back in why you're growing up, um, what were some of the things, especially when you were learning English that you now apply and we're gonna get into potential, but were there moments and in your when you go back to your childhood that you see now in some of the clients, clientele or the people you're trying to serve that uh you you see as commonalities um and say this is this is why potential is valid or is a, is a need, I'm meeting a need here. Um I know those are two different climates. China is not the same as Boston or the United States, but uh, do you see yourself? I think pretty much I'm asking, do you see yourself in some of your clientele uh, based on your childhood experience um, while learning English from Taylor Swift? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a very great question. And I definitely see myself from time to time from, um, you know, nowadays the adult immigrants who are potential learners taking our classes. But at the same time, I recognize that I had the privilege to, you know, manage a better life compared to new arrival. Like, I, I think I had a privilege because I was a student and I didn't have so many responsibilities that I have to juggle. So I basically just learned the language. There was definitely challenge, similar challenge in language, but there was uh, not that many challenges as, you know, like a typical immigrant who would have to settle down, find housing, support their children's education while finding the job to support the whole, maybe not just one job, like several jobs doing shifts to support the whole family. 
Um, so I think I'm at the same time like privileged compared to that situation, but also like I definitely experienced the similar challenges uh, in terms of language and social isolation. Yep, um, yep. Before talking about English, I definitely want to add another anecdote of my story. So when I moved to Hong Kong, um, the official language in addition to English in Hong Kong is actually Cantonese. That's what people say uh, when they are not doing, you know, lectures in the university or like more official um, presentation, people all speak Cantonese. But for me, I speak Mandarin. And Mandarin and Cantonese, although they're based on the same language system, the pronunciation is totally different. And it sounds like Portuguese and Spanish. So you basically get a sense of what people are talking about. But if you don't speak Cantonese and as a Mandarin speaker, you cannot communicate with them. And that was actually the first time I experienced language barrier. Although I had the ability to use English to communicate with people, but that's not the language that really bring people together in Hong Kong. That you have to be able to speak Cantonese to get a part-time job as a barista uh, in a cafe at your university, which I didn't have the opportunity because of this lacking language skills. Um, I also got lost on buses because uh, there was not very clear, uh, you know, announcement about like the destination in English like I remember all the destinations in Chinese but they pronounced that Chinese word in Cantonese uh, while the English translation could be a totally different uh, yep. meaning so yep. a lot of challenges um, and I also weren't able to build a lot of good relationship with the Hong Kong local students just because I don't have their language like we definitely do group projects and this and that but can we hang out and grab coffee? That's very rare because of that barrier. And interestingly, when I came to the States, I thought, well, I, I studied English for so many years, like almost two decades. Um, and I passed the proficiency test. I should be all set, uh, not experiencing the same isolation. But interestingly, it's very different to use English in a country uh, where it's official, English is its official language compared to just use English in exam settings or in class settings. Yeah. Um, so interestingly, when I came here, the first thing I need to do is to call National Grade uh, mm -hmm. to get my electricity set up for my shared apartment with two other roommates. And I just couldn't understand what the person on the other side of the phone was talking about. I mean, that person was speaking perfect English and like in the super fast speed. Uh, something I just could not comprehend very well. So I missed a lot of details on how to set up the account. And it took me five days to eventually figure out what they want from me. And that five days, we just didn't have electricity in our apartment. And you have nothing to do to like to solve that. You, you just have to figure out what they mean. Yeah. So I think that again showed me that I still have the language barrier, even with a language that I've been learning for so long. And looking back, because Jacob, you asked me like, what are some like common challenges, challenges I share with immigrants uh, who just came to this country with no language skills. I think it's really first, the confidence of using this language. And second, the opportunity to practice um, this language with native speakers in the local community. So first, the thing is definitely you lack confidence when you don't speak well. That's just uh, true among most of the language learners, whatever language you are learning. Um, because when you speak in the language that's so broken, you would feel that's not who yourself. You would feel it's showing your intellectually just uh, not so capable of doing things in this country, which is not true. But when you speak in a broken language to other people who are so fluent, you naturally have that kind of um, psychology inside you like thinking like I'm not good enough so confidence is one thing um and second one as I said opportunity so when I came here as a student even if I started with quite broken uh, oral English I had the opportunity to present week after week in front of my whole class and discuss uh, the project with my peers so I got the chance to force myself to speak English all the time and that's how I got improved but if you think about an immigrant's situation, they are in a job almost all the time, and then they're involved with their family. 
uh, within the family, they definitely speak their native language that they're more comfortable with. And in the job, usually they either don't have time to talk to anyone. For for example, they could be in a busy um, cashier or say like shift worker as a janitor in the university. You just keep cleaning the space. You don't have time to talk to anyone. And sometimes you might even get a job in your own ethnic community. Say a Brazilian immigrant could be working in a Brazilian market, which means they would mostly speak Portuguese with their customers and colleagues. They still don't get a chance to speak English. So that's what I mean by opportunity to practice. I think that's something that's really missing for these adult immigrants to build um, confidence and better communication skills in English. No, definitely, definitely. I think beyond that too. I think uh, just <clears throat> I think building on that too. I think um, you know once you figure out. Uh, I think one thing that's beautiful about what you're building, um, which um, I think will be pretty evident as you continue to scale and kind of reach out is you unlock a new wall into uh, this um, into these families. Like when you speak, when you're able to speak a language in a new in that new country, um, like opportunities open up, um, and it's not just job opportunities. I think, but it's just the, this sense of um, belonging that it comes with all these different. Um, benefits as well yeah so, yeah it's it's beyond language i totally agree so we always think maybe language is just one skill you need um for like better career for something but it's interconnected with so many other aspects in life say you have to talk to your children's school teacher we know there's great translation tools or platform for them to communicate in their own native language while the teacher can still tell them like what's going on but there's still a barrier like whether you can use the language to directly communicate with the teacher or whether you have to rely on a tool it's definitely creating some different i, I would say uh, feelings for the parents and teacher relationship and that will possibly affect the children's growth as well so that's one thing um and if we look from like a whole society as a whole, this is not just a problem for immigrants themselves. So if they don't have the ability to express themselves, to have the voice, to participate in the civic issues in this country, then our like other communities, basically when they don't talk to each other in the common language, they don't understand each other. And that's how a lot of times we have misunderstanding and hatred happening in our communities. That's definitely like because lack of uh, communication is definitely one of the core factors that's contributing to this problem. And at the same time, like we said, we think immigrants are hindered by their language skills to get a better career, get a better job. But in the, at the same time, this country is lacking so much labor force to work in you know certain markets and they just have this labor shortage issue at the same time we have this many so talented immigrants with their potential just hampered because they don't have the language skills so i think this is um this is not just about immigrants struggle this is whole society's issue that we should have to pay attention to and solving the language barrier is not just benefiting immigrants i think it benefits the society as a whole Definitely, definitely. This uh, high degree of upward mobility and um, that yeah. just yeah, I, I think the perfect timing. You, know, you guys are building at the right at the right time. Um, pretty Thank exciting. You. Um, so why 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 Boston? Why are you here? It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So it definitely went back to when I chose uh you know graduate schools to apply. Um. I compared different countries. U.S. was not the only destination. I thought about staying in Hong Kong for masters, maybe go to, uh, you know, the U.K. for a shorter masters, which is usually one year. Um, so I was just exploring different opportunities, but definitely, I had a preference for the U.S. because I actually came to the U.S. the first time in 2016 uh, after I finished my sophomore year in Hong Kong. I came to. Uh, I went to. I went to UC Berkeley for a summer school. So it was more like just short exploration uh, during the six weeks, but I just enjoyed the life 
here so much. I first, I just like the diversity that there are so many different people um, in this country doing the things whether they like or they're passionate about, and you can all talk to them. You you can talk to them. They share experience with you, and it's just so eye opening. It's it blew my mind to feel that you know I'm I can live in such a diverse place and build something that I'm passionate about. That's something I really liked about uh, the U.S. And second, I think it was just it was very simple that they have better air quality <laughs> in the U.S. Like it, it was very interesting. I, I'm pretty sure it's true in many other countries, but it was my experience combined with you know the diversity and good air quality. Um, although some people might argue California doesn't have the best air quality, but I grew up I grew up in China. Like Inner Mongolia is a place we constantly have sandstorms and all the bad uh, air quality stuff. Um, so I appreciated this um, good environment. It just makes me. It made me feel so happy, and also it was California. I mean, it's it, it's a happy place <laughs> with the sunshine, with the palm trees, the beach, uh, everything that looks so perfect. So I, I think I built a positive image back then. Um, so again, two years later, when I applied to graduate school, I, I think um, you know U.S. is definitely the best choice if any school can admit me. Uh, and why specifically Boston? I think I didn't have, um, you know, this specific interest in Boston back then. So I've applied to schools in Texas, in California, in New York City, and then in Massachusetts, majorly around Boston for sure. Um, but interestingly, I find this program at Tufts University, it's called Innovation and Management. Um, so when I applied for graduate school, I actually wanted to continue with my career in finance or marketing which is related to my undergraduate study. Um, and this program, although they are not specifically focusing on business, but it's, it's management. And they talk about how to either create a startup or work in a startup, or just there's also this concept of entrepreneur, like the, um, the basics you learn how to be an entrepreneur can actually be applied um, to any aspects in life. Like even if you're an employee, you can apply the same rules and um, principles. So I thought about this program being a really great business, uh, you know, master's degree for me. So I just applied along with many other places. It was an interview with a program director mm -hmm. that made me feel Boston is the right place and I have to go to this program at Tufts. Um, because the director, he was really inspiring and he just made me feel that I have so much potential that's yet to be uh, discovered in that program. And they have a very flexible program offering. So it doesn't sound like I'm just going to participate in a lot more classes, same as undergrad, and write the thesis as a graduation requirement and finish with a better degree, a more advanced degree but rather it's a program that allows you to ask yourself, who are you and where are you trying to go? And what is your passionate about? And what, what is your dream? I know it's all very inspirational um, questions, but I really found this program being unique. Uh, I think that was the first time I found Boston is the place mm -hmm. I really wanted to go. Um, so yeah, I, I was lucky I got admitted in this program because we had really good call during that interview and I ended up in Boston. Yeah. Um, talking about why Potencia is funded in Boston, we decided to stay here. Uh, I think it's related to our model. So initially we started by training college students as volunteer English tutors to help their community. Um, so Boston as a college town, like whole Massachusetts, I think we have this better access to the pool of college students as our tutor. That's one thing. And second, in general, Massachusetts is one of the states with really high uh, immigrant population in general in the United States. So I think it's a good uh, market to start with. So that's why we just decided to stay in Boston. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I think I... There are many things that you mentioned. I think most of our, um, you know, our guest uh, in the podcast, you know, there's always something about somebody at some point in your 
entrepreneurial or just even their life that kind of they found that um someone believed in um in their potential this director uh gave that opportunity for you to see that um and i think you know something in hindsight is like if you didn't come to tufts you probably couldn't have found this market um you know there's a ripple effect that one decision um led to the other led to the other and now the case has been made but you know um it's difficult to see once you take the first step and i think that's how entrepreneurship is right like we don't really get to see the big picture it's just that leap of faith, but also some element of intuition that has built what you're building now. And I'm sure five years from now will be a different uh, story after you understand the market and you are building um, something that will be more transcendent, uh, just based on the output that you're putting in now, the work you're putting in now, it's kind of deliver that. I really love the fact that you, uh, you had this uh, interest um, you know, one in, you know, getting out of finance. I think finance uh, is important and very valid in many ways, but for you to take that approach to management innovation, I think that helps kind of build value. Mm -hmm. Just for us to kind of get, so now we already talk about potential here. Uh, we have already got into the topic, but before I take us, before we just get into that, because I think that's very interesting. Um, so between uh, starting the program and so uh, let me just rephrase. So we is you and your co-founder, right? You guys met mm -hmm. at Tufts. Yes. So it was through this program. Okay. Um, so what happened between, uh, so behind the scenes, we talk about you, it was a class project. Yeah. What happened from that class project to to now? Uh, if you can just share a little bit about that before we talk, in, talk about uh, potential. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So... Let me start with how our master's program is structured. Um, we were supposed to do the sprint project each semester. The reason why it's called sprint is because it's so fast. It's over roughly two and a half months semester length. You have to find a problem, figure out a solution, create a whole business idea, and eventually pitch this business like a like a finished product in front of group of judges at the end of the semester. So that's the concept of sprint project. Um, so the first semester I did a project with a few teammates on a medical device that's um, developed by a Tufts professor, which was really fun, but medical device is not something I'm really good at considering my background, <laughs> uh, non-engineering pieces related. Um, so in the second semester, you could either continue with your old project or create another project and do a whole new sprint. That's what we did. And people can share their project ideas in front of the whole class and recruit teammates right on the spot. Mm -hmm. uh, my co-founder, Jun, he was the one who shared his idea about helping refugees and immigrants in the US in front of the whole class. Definitely there was no concept of focusing on language barriers or um, you know, more specific what he wants to achieve, but he shared his story of being a South Korean, um, passionate about the unification and North Korean refugees living in South Korea. Um, he shared his story and saying, because US also has so many refugees and immigrants coming in every year. He believed if we can find a solution here, it will in the long term help him find solution for his own project about North Korean refugees, like replicate the model. So it was something that really intrigued me because I grew up being someone who really wanted to do something with a social impact without any resources or mentors telling me what I can do. So I would daydream on my way coming back from my elementary school thinking like, well, the climate change is a real issue now. What if I create a nonprofit and just educate people how to uh, you know, deal with climate change? I still vividly remember that thought, which was so random. 
uh, I was just seeing plastic by bags flowing, uh, flying. I was just seeing plastic bags flying in the sandstorm in Inner Mongolia, uh, which is direct impact of bad climate and you know like all of this change. And I was like, we gotta do something. But of course, that idea quickly went away because uh, there was no such support system for a young entrepreneur to do um, a nonprofit. So that was the like the time I heard, wow, there is something I can really participate. And although it's a class project, but I can explore so much. So I got intrigued together with two other teammates. Uh, we joined my co-founders team. So we became a team of four. The other two teammates, uh, one is same like me, a mainland student who came to the U.S. with some levels of language barriers. Um, like not saying like we already knew we we're gonna work on language, but we sort of experienced what immigrants experience. The other um, person, our teammate, is from Jordan, who witnessed the refugee camps in Jordan while he grew up there, um, and is very passionate about making a change to this group of people as well. Um, so that's how the four of us got together and we started working on this project. And the name was also brought by my co-founder, Jun. So he already had this idea tested uh, on refugees and immigrants. It's called Potentia, uh, ending with TIA back then. It was a Latin word for, it's a word root for potential. So mm -hmm. that's why he picked the name. And in his uh, senior year at Tufts, he was trying to do some caregiver, um, you know, project, helping immigrants getting, helping refugees become caregivers. So solving their career problems and also solve this labor shortage in the caregiving industry. Uh, so some very brief ideas out there and we started working on it. So that's how everything started from like the entering the program to how the project got formed. Yeah, that, that's pretty inspiring. I, I think I always tell people, if you do business, went to go to business school, you do um, uh, programs like this, um, the your return on your on your tuition is meeting people like this because that's a true value. If you connect with people, like-minded people in these programs and you build something that is of value, I think that's right. the cool that's the real return on investment. It's not really the what you learn in class. It's this, it's the people you meet, uh, and they will change. Some some of them, you know, they they change your life uh, in many ways. I Absolutely. really love that story. I really love the story. So now, what what's this, uh, what's going on with? Uh, um, um, can you just give us kind of uh, what you guys have been doing in Boston so far? Uh, and if if you don't mind sharing what you guys have planned for twenty twenty four. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we'd love to hear. I th I'm sure our audience would love to hear. I, you never know; someone can reach out to you and invest, uh, and there are many other things. Or even love to volunteer or be a part of your program. So, if you don't mind sharing, like what you guys have been doing in Boston this past year, and what you guys plan on doing in 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I didn't mention this, but my co-founder and I had two years of visa struggles outside of U.S. Um, between 2021 to the end of 2022. So that was a real struggling time, especially during COVID that we tried to keep Potencia afloat while we were in totally the other part of the earth, um, you know, running the business with a 12 hour, 13 hour difference, uh, time zone difference. So we came back last October and I would say 2023 was really critical to us because it was the first the full year operation that we were able to do everything in the country and continue to test um, different initiatives to really grow the business. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2023, something we've achieved first is definitely the growth in the tutor base. In the past fall semester, we were able to train 52 new tutors from six universities. Uh, which we never reached before. And that again, um, proved us that there are people interested in this and we can train them. Um, so that's one achievement. And another one is we continued with the mobile app development. Um, the Potencia mobile app 
it's not a language education app per se, but it's more like a facility. Um, the facility. app is, yeah, the, the app facilitates the matching process for mm -hmm. the tutors and the learners to find the best time and the best match. So with we are hoping for this app, adult immigrants will be truly empowered to pick classes that fit their schedule, learning needs, uh, native language requirement the best instead of just staying on the wait list of certain service provider for two years without knowing whether you're getting into the class or not, whether this class is best fit for you or not. So that's what we are doing with the app. And we didn't have the budget and a person to work on it. So we relied on student teams at Tufts University and they contributed so much to this app and it's been developed by first one team for a year and now another capstone project team. Um, so the app has been um, going really well and we are supposed to have our, the first clickable and downloadable version in summer 2024. Um, the other one is community um, partnership that we were really trying to build in 2023. So we built partnership with city halls, so like the city we are based in, the city of Malden, and other community organizations who also serve uh, immigrant population in general. And we try to run programs together in 2024 to first scale our service capacity and second, serve a bigger number of immigrants with the power of this partnership. Yep. So that's what we've been doing in 2023. And definitely we were fundraising all the time. Uh, it's challenging for a nonprofit startup to fundraise because a lot of grants would require a longer history and credibility in your organization to um, make the decision to donate to you. But at the same time, we were able to build stewardship with some local foundations, such as the Boston Foundation, and gain initial support from them, which was critical for us to continue the operation into 2024. Um, we are grateful. And yeah, that, that's what we did in 2023. And for the next year, the major um, direction is first, again, the partnership. So continue to enhance and uh, you know, establish more partnerships with the within the community and trying to spread the um, the words, spread the word about Potencia and also get the service scaled to another level. Um, the second is the app. We look forward to finishing the app and testing it within our learners and tutors and continue to develop. Uh, third one is continue to grow our tutor base by setting up more chapters at colleges and even corporate offices um, to really increase the service capacity. So in terms of what we need, definitely volunteers are welcomed. You can directly apply on our website. It's very intuitive and straightforward um, process, very short application form. Um, you can help us set up a chapter at your university or your office um, by leading a team of volunteers to recruit and train our tutors to provide more classes for the immigrants. Um, third, we're definitely, definitely looking for sponsors and corporate or foundation um, grants to support our growth. So for now, we have two co-founders running this full-time, taking the minimum salary, um, not really covering all the costs, but we're trying to bring this to the next level. So I would say funding is needed to create a more transformative impact on our, in, on our community and any sort of collaboration partnership would be welcome. Definitely. Definitely. I know for a fact you, you guys will succeed because the need is there and you guys are, um, building something that, um, um, you guys are building the right way. Um, I think just to point out, so it's Potencia, uh, the Inc. So P-O-T-E-N-C-I-A-I-I-N-C dot <laughs> org slash teacher dash apply. I think that's where you can apply as a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put all these links in the description. So um, I just want to point that out. Uh, There's a donation button as well. People can donate. Um, and as and as you alluded to, right, uh, 
I think um, sponsors and partners uh, will be uh, are welcome. So please reach out uh, on their website as well. You get information there as well. I I I'm, I this this is exciting to me, uh, especially as a, as an immigrant myself uh, a long time ago. Um, but I think there is there is I think there'll be um, there'll be uh, a lot of interest. Uh, and I think sometimes just one connection can really change everything. So yep. I invite all, all my uh, listeners, as well as uh, those who are passionate about this work, uh, please check out uh, your website, uh, which I'll include in the link below. Um, and you can definitely reach out to us. Well, I think LinkedIn is okay, right? For, for connections and stuff like that. So I'll put in all the contacts below. Uh, but this is great work. Uh, thanks for sharing. And thanks for being consistent. I think sometimes just to survive, especially your first two years. Yeah. And, and you know, just keep it, keep it on it. Uh, just to get to kind of the last phase, and I think these are more, uh, I'll say, lightweight questions. It's much more, uh, much more chill. Um, so we, we end with a lighter note here. Uh, one thing um, I, I love to... So, what what is something that I, I, so one thing I, I checked I you uh, there's a blog you wrote and you said don't eat too much ramen. This was a blog. <laughs> you talk about your startup ex experience and I was trying to do some research and you said don't eat too much ramen. What what was the what made you to write that blog? Because you talk you talk about your startup <laughs> experience. <laughs> you said you said uh. uh I think that one caught my attention. I was like, hmm, because, you know, sometimes, you know, startups, we, we try to be as lean as possible. Um, but you said, at least try some alternatives, like oats, pasta, bananas. I don't yeah. know if you saw this. This was like three years ago. I uh, do. I, I, I'm i surprised that you found that. <laughs> it's just, I have to, uh, you know, go back to that blog. It was funny because I started writing that when the COVID hit. Because um, yeah. I really wanted to reflect on my um, entrepreneurship journey, which I was only on for a little bit over a year. <laughs> so I was very, very, very newbie back then. Um, some of the advice might not um, be applicable if I look back today, but I still agree with that. <laughs> Don't eat too much ramen. <laughs> so it's not the fancy Japanese ramen you eat in restaurants, but the instant ramen. Uh, yes. that you would boil and just eat quickly when you miss the timing to cook food or when you are mostly super lean on a budget so you don't really have like you know the, the budget to buy a better food than ramen um yeah I, I learned that you might feel good for saving money and time and energy by eating ramen at the moment but then it will bring you so much bad consequences such as lack of energy drowsiness um you could have some inflammation somewhere inside your body that you don't feel comfortable and it eventually destroys your progress at work <laughs> yes. so i found that for example um there are really affordable groceries at certain stores so I try those stores to buy, you know, like same thing, but at a better price. Uh, and I try to manage my grocery really well by not overbuying and by try to consume everything I bought. And also just by cooking uh, for myself instead of going out to eat also saved me a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, all of this, even just seriously, just like salad and bananas, they're so much better than ramen. Um, and you might feel they are, in terms of unit price, a little bit more expensive than those instant ramen, but health is very important for an entrepreneur because you cannot afford to get sick and you cannot afford to take a three day off straight, yes. um, you know, in the middle of something. So yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it's, the, <laughs> it's the ROI analysis of what yes. you and I, I would keep that as, you know, a real advice to all entrepreneurs. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's a finite game, but within it is an infinity game, right? Like your health is, you're playing your, I mean, you know, much as you want to build something that is um, long-term, like your health is a bigger game to play in this uh, 
realm of life. And I think I, I loved I, that. I found that just randomly, just trying to do some research. And I was like, okay, that's a very interesting take. And it's surprising. Um, yeah. Yes. It helped me. What was, what's something that, um, what's the best advice you've received so far um, mm -hmm. on this journey that has talked with you or maybe, it might not necessarily be an advice, but a life philosophy or uh, a perspective that has really guided you to yeah, to get by, yeah. to do well, um, in 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 uh, as a yeah. as a CEO. Mm -hmm. I have to say, you know, a lot of times it's senseless advice that gets you by, like that keeps that keeps you moving. Um, but if I really have to pick one, um, that affected me very posit positively, impact me very positively recently. Uh, mm -hmm. is this one that for the people around you, the majority of them, say 98% of them will tell you what you do is not going to be possible. Mm -hmm. But what you need to do is to trust the other 2% or the other few people who told you, you got this, you got to continue because this is going to make a difference. And listen to them, listen to your heart and just keep pushing. Um, the reason why why the reason why I picked this one is because 2023 was actually hard. There was a time for after April for like six months we didn't have any extra funding coming in, and it's just like you are spending all the donations you've um, raised before April, but you don't see any more coming in, and you start to wonder is this really feasible? Like if people stop investing in you, like how can you continue? And at the same time, your family is adding pressure to this. They're like, see, people people don't really want to fund you because they might not think this will work. And they start to give you pressure to uh, really rethink about this route you've been taking. Um, and I think that advice, I don't, I don't remember who told me or where I saw that um, really, just settled me <laughs> and kept me going. I really like that. It's really powerful. And do you know the funny thing? Once you make it, which you are yeah, on the path, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I, told, I knew she would do it. Absolutely. <laughs> they always do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, but I really love that. I think that's very powerful. Is this something that for other immigrant entrepreneurs uh, out there who are trying to build something like what you're trying to do? Um, uh, I know this this episode will be um, I think will probably exist in 2040. Um, you know, something that I always I'm always curious about, like what what do you think? If you had to meet your younger self or another uh, immigrant entrepreneur who is trying to build something, what would you kind of tell them, or hopefully um, give them as a as a recommendation? Not necessarily an advice, but a recommendation on how to get going. Um, yeah. it. I love this question. I think it's very needed in, you know, the current context. Well, we have so many immigrants trying to build something, but with so limited resources, and you don't even have generational network or wealth yeah. that's supporting you to become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, reflecting on my journey, I would say one of the most important things I've learned is to find your allies and build your relationship with them. So for example, I identify as Asian women entrepreneur myself. Um, so I naturally go to a lot of events and resource centers, foundations who you know, publicly announce that they support entrepreneurs like me. So they are definitely run they, they should be run by immigrants or women, led by immigrants or women, like something I care about um, and care about social change. That's something I go for. And the lesson I learned is that when you talk to someone who already know who, where you are from, right, your background and who you are, what challenges you are facing as an, so called, for, for example, what challenges you are facing as an immigrant or as a woman in the social sector, they will be able to help you better. They will be able to understand your unique challenges and introduce you to the resources or give you the resources that you're looking for uh, compared to just going to 
this doesn't mean I don't recommend people um, try other resources, but I'm saying like comparing to spending time on a random accelerator that doesn't really specify in your field um, or for people who share an identity with you, yep. you might have a lower chance or even if you get in, you might not find a community that you really belong. So I, I think finding allies and bring them in either as your founder, your partner, your board member, your tutor, like everything for us, this was really important. And I, I think that's a, like, I think that's something everyone should try to find their allies. Yeah, I love that. Find this support out there. You just need to find it. Um, mm -hmm. That can help you, especially when you're starting. So the last question, what do you want? Uh, I know you and your co-founders are very young, but what's, what's the legacy you want to leave behind? Yeah, um, for me, I think the legacy, if I would be able to leave, is definitely something about social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Say, I at least I planned for you know my next few years. Um, I would say foreseeable future. In addition to running Potencia, like continuously building my social startup. I would want to mentor other social entrepreneurs and share with them my experience and help them build their own social venture. And if I will be able to have more resources, more connections, then it's also my responsibility to share this resources and connections with you know the next generation of social entrepreneurs because it's really about partnership in social innovation that's solving the problems that our governments or the private sectors cannot solve. Um, and I just want to, you know, give this as much as possible. And I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but that's the direction I'm trying to go. That's just powerful. I think, yeah, I mean, it, do, it does answer. And I think sometimes, you know, um, as you, um, I think inevitably uh, you'll make it. I, I'm, I'm confident about that. Um, so um, the 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 possibility of i think it's all about the heart and you know and if you're hard working the mindset is there the market is there, everything is aligned uh it's just you know going through um the ups and downs of, of of being an entrepreneur um but i love it i love that you want to give back to community i think that's the kind of the infinite game here because it's gonna last longer than uh just lifetime so um i really love the, what you guys are doing um uh, to all our listeners, please check out potentia.org. Uh, maybe in two or three years, it's coming to a city next near you. Um, so, uh, but, you know, as a start in Boston, if you can volunteer, we'll have the links of the website. Um, you know, check out the work they're doing. I think to all partners we have uh, in Boston, please check out the work they're doing. Uh, this goes beyond just, you know, uh, the tutoring, but it's helping immigrant families live a better life. So. Uh, uh, thank you for your day-to-day -day work that we don't see. Um, keep up the work, please. And uh, I'm excited to see what you guys will achieve next year and many years to come. So thanks thanks for being on the podcast. Appreciate you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for having me. Awesome. So for all our listeners, we'll have uh, um, we'll know some upcoming guests for 2024, but I think this is our last but one episode. So please uh, stay oh, wow. tuned. <laughs> Yeah, a special guest. Wow. I'm so honored. And thank you. I think you have really good questions. Um, and they help me reflect on, you know, what's what's going on. Like it's it's hard to find a time to reflect. And this is end of the year, you know, we sat down and we chat about this. I, I'm grateful. <laughs> thank you, Jacob. Seriously. Well, thank you too. Thank you too. I'm grateful. Yeah. Okay. So I'll see you guys in twenty twenty four and thanks mm -hmm. for listening. Take yep. care, guys. Thank you.